All right. So Yossi covered variant filtration, which is going to happen at the variant level or at the site level. And then this next step in our workflow, we're going to improve the sample level data by recalibrating the genotype likelihoods and potentially improving some of the genotype calls. So this is in the later end of our pipeline. After we have our analysis ready variants, genotype refinement is one option for further post-processing. So a lot of people only care about variants. They want to know, you know, how is my sample different from the reference? Where is there variation in this population? And they say it doesn't matter if it's heterozygous or homozygous variant. But I think you should care about genotypes. And why should you care about genotypes? Because it has implications for medical genetics. Uh, for example, do any of the patients involved in a particular study have two copies of a loss of function mutation, or even just one copy of a loss of function mutation? And a lot of genes will affect the impact of that protein. Um, and knowing the genotype of the individuals in a family could predict whether the parents of a child with a disease are likely to have another child that's also afflicted, which helps them in their family. And population geneticists also use genotypes when they do association studies for various traits because the number of copies equates to the dosage of that allele. And so if you have more copies of the variant protein, because you're homozygous variant, then you might see a stronger effect than if you were just heterozygous for that variant. So the variant call, right, is the, the site, the line in the VCF. There's variation somewhere in one of our samples. There's some copy of chromosomes that are different from the reference. But the genotype call is going to tell you exactly which alleles are present in each of those samples. So the call quality is important uh, because even if you have a variant you have really high confidence in, within the samples that have that variant, the genotype calls might be ambiguous. Um, they could be low confidence where there weren't a lot of reads, some of the base qualities on the reads weren't great. You say, well, it might be homozygous variant, but there was one sort of dubious reference read. Um, and in some cases they can be entirely wrong. Uh, and sometimes there's sampling error too, right? Because you're going to sequence some number of reads at each position, and there's always a chance that just by luck you'll get all the reads from the same haplotype without sampling any reads from the other haplotype. And so the idea is to use additional data that's independent from the BAM sequencing data that we started with to improve our genotype calls. So you can use high quality data from another project, like Thousand Genomes, uh, to form a population prior. You can use a pedigree if you're working with family data to take into account the relationship between individuals, knowing that they share a lot of their genetic information. And you can incorporate this data to calculate further posterior genotype probabilities. So we looked at Bayes' rule a little bit in the haplotype caller slides, but we'll get more into it now that we're actually using priors that are informative. <clears throat> so I'm going to posit the scenario where your coworker just walked into the office and she has an umbrella. And so making this observation, what do you think is the probability that it's raining outside? So the umbrella is the observation. The parameter theta is the probability of rain that we're trying to observe. And so the likelihood that someone would carry an umbrella with them given that it's raining is pretty high, right? Um, but it depends on what your prior is. So for example, you might be here in Finland in the winter where there's a lot of precipitation, or maybe you guys had a rainy summer, I heard, in which case, like, if this person had an umbrella, it's probably raining. But imagine you're studying abroad, you're in sunny Los Angeles, then you would say, oh, well, I, the, probability, the prior probability of rain in Los Angeles is actually incredibly low. So even though the likelihood of this person um, having an umbrella because it's raining is pretty high, given the low probability, the posterior on actually having rain in Los Angeles is pretty low. And so maybe it's more likely that this person is carrying the umbrella to shield their pale skin from the sun. So it just goes to show that a prior probability can have a very high impact on the posterior probability, even if you have a strong likelihood. And again, we're calculating genotype likelihood and we're trying to apply priors from the population allele frequencies in order to inform better genotype posteriors. 
So this particular workflow is going to start with recalibrated variants that have been through VQSR. We're going to apply population priors from some resource like thousand genomes. If you have trios, you can also apply family priors by giving the pedigree to describe how your trio is related. And then that's going to pass through the Calculate Genotype Posteriors tool, which is going to improve the posterior probabilities for each genotype and potentially change some of the calls. And then we can do some genotype filtration to leave only our high quality genotypes and we can run variant annotator to specifically pick out high confidence de novo mutations if that's something of interest to your study. So to run genotype posteriors, uh, the command line is going to look very similar. If you have a pedigree for trios involved in your study, you can supply it um, as a .ped file with the ped argument. And if you have available to your, to your organism that you're studying a population with high quality genotypes, then you can supply uh, population.vcf supporting information to get a good estimate of the prior allele frequencies for those variants. So this is an example of an IGV screenshot for some data um, on which we applied the population priors from 1,000 genomes. So um, looking at VCFs in IGV is a little bit different, but I'll walk you through it. So the original call um, was homozygous variant. That's what this um, cyan bar there means, and it's showing a red bar that's pretty much full because it's showing two copies of the red allele, which I think is a T. And then we're showing the VCF entry for the 1,000 genomes project, which so only saw an allele frequency of 0.2% across all the populations in 1,000 genomes. So this individual that you have sequenced has two copies of an allele that's incredibly rare among the 1,000 genomes samples. And so when we calculate the posterior genotype, it actually becomes a heterozygous call. And if we look, uh, because this is NA12878, we can reference the NIST data, um, and we can also look at her BAM. So the original likelihoods that she had for her genotypes were very confidently not homozygous reference, but in between the HET and the home var calls, the genotype quality was only three. And so if we apply this really strong prior showing that this allele is incredibly rare in the populations that we've looked at so far, and we recalibrate the posterior probabilities, the new posterior genotype call is a heterozygous call with a confidence that's been improved from Q3 to Q27. And so a very similar thing can happen if you have a heterozygous call with a very high allele frequency from your population. So for example, here we had an even less informative call because it's actually GQ0. So we said pretty much you can toss a coin. I don't know if it's a HET or a home var call. But given that this allele is incredibly common across all the populations in 1,000 genomes, it's more likely that this person actually has two copies than one copy. So the new genotype is called home var, and the confidence is improved from GQ0 uh, to 16. <clears throat> and so overall, you can plot the empirical qualities versus the observed qualities um, in the same way that we did for BQSR. So if we take slices of genotypes from our VCF based on each reported quality, then we can compare them to some known truth resource to get the empirical quality, right? So if we have a call that's GQ30, then in the FRED scale, that means that there's a one in a thousand chance that that call is wrong, right? So if you look at 10,000 calls that are GQ30, over 10,000, if there's really a one in a thousand chance that it's wrong, you expect to see about 10 errors. So we reference that with our truth set, we count up how many errors we actually have, and then that'll give us our empirical quality. And so if we did this for um, some data from NA12878 where we have a good uh, truth data to reference, we see that if we look at the homozygous reference calls, they are actually underconfident. So the calls that we had, um, for example, here, we reported at 15, but they're actually evaluated empirically about 20. So we actually have, there's more, there should be more confidence in our homozygous reference calls than we're reporting. 
which could have impacts on your study if you're doing like a, an association study, for example, and you filter out genotypes that are below a certain confidence. If you recalibrate your data, now you'll have more good data to work with because there are more variants that are going to exceed your quality threshold. <coughs> On the other hand, um, the homozygous variant calls in this group, if we look at the same thing, for the reported genotype quality of 15, we're going to see that it actually falls below that X equals Y line, so we are overconfident in our homozygous variant calls. And so there are probably some in there that are actually errors, um, but if we run the recalibration, then we see that the posterior calls here in this blue-green color are a lot closer to that X equals Y line, showing that they're better recalibrated. So um, we can do this for all of the homozygous reference calls. And we see that by applying the priors from cells and genome samples, uh, we can separate them out into correct calls and incorrect calls. And running a linear regression through the correct calls, we see that the slope stays about the same. But most of the calls get a boost of about Q10, um, which is great because that's a big improvement in all your, all your correct genotype calls. And on the other hand, if we're looking at incorrect calls, they don't seem to get a quality boost at all. So they stay about the same. We don't want to elevate the quality of the incorrect calls. And a lot of them, uh, so these are, are um, the ones that are wrong are, are still wrong, but the, they're not being biased in a, in a way that makes them look like they're more confident than they are. So if you have trios in your sample, uh, which is a very useful study design for a lot of different applications, uh, we know that the child can only inherit alleles that they get from their parents. And so there are some combinations of genotypes that are valid in a trio, but then there are some combinations that just aren't possible biologically outside of de novo mutations. And so um, haplotype caller gives us the probability of the child's genotype given the child's data. But what we can get from the posteriors is the probability of the genotype of the child given the data from the child and also from the parents, which is more powerful. <laughs> So we can apply the Bayesian rule here um, for trios. And we're going to describe this probability that the mother, father, and child have a certain combination of genotypes with this rule such that if there's one Mendelian violation, um, we give that a probability mu. If there are two Mendelian violations, we give that a probability mu squared. And if there are no Mendelian violations and they have a valid a uh, heritable genotype combination that you would expect, then um, that comes from the uh, unity minus the number of configurations that yield a single Mendelian violation minus two possibilities for two Mendelian violations, which is pretty high uh, because typically that factor mu is, is a number that's quite small. And so we can derive these posteriors, for example, that the child is homozygous reference given the data by inputting the child's genotype likelihood, um, applying this prior according to the genotypes of the mother and the father, and normalizing as we typically do with Bayes' rule. So again, for the homozygous reference calls in the case of using this family information from the pedigree, we see that the incorrect calls, unfortunately, stay about the same when they are incorrect. Sometimes they are uh, improved, like we saw in the examples when the genotype changes. Um, and then for correct calls, we can actually boost the confidence by about 13 quality points in the FRED scale. So the next step is, uh, as you might want to apply to perhaps an association study, would be to filter ambiguous low confidence calls. A lot of analysts that we work with at the Broad tend to filter genotype calls that are below GQ20. Again, 20 is going to be 99% confidence, so over you know, a couple million variants in a call set, uh, you don't want to see more than 1% of those genotypes being incorrect. And so this helps us restrict the analysis that we're going to do downstream just to our highest quality data. Um, and so finally, you can run this through variant annotator um, with an annotation called possible de novo to tag de novo variants in cases where you have related samples. 
Uh, and so this is particularly useful if you have a trio design where you're looking at a rare disease in the offspring um, in order to incorporate the fact that there are now high quality calls in all the individuals because we separated out to just GQ20 and above. And given that the parents both have GQ20 home ref calls, are there any de novo calls of HETs in the offspring where we didn't see that allele in the parent? Um, so what are de novo mutations? Uh, they do lead to a variety of rare Mendelian disorders. Um, it depends on a lot of different factors. Different studies have reported uh, various values and even values that vary with the parent's age. But there are about 30 de novo mutations per genome, so you'll see less than one de novo per exome typically. And that's the case where the parents are homozygous referenced. And then the child has this new um, HET genotype call where the one variant uh, appeared spontaneously in the child and wasn't inherited. Um, and so in order to to have a high confident de novo, we use these um, characteristics that were set out from an autism study done at the Broad. This, uh, across a large study, it has to be a novel uh, variant. So it's only in the child, it's not in the parents, and typically we restrict it to not also being in any of the other samples that were in that study if we're looking at multiple trios. Um, so then that's our rarity criterion. And we also find that it's very important to set a confidence threshold on the parents because you might be undersampling one of the parents' haplotypes. And so it's not that the parent was actually homozygous reference and there was a de novo, but it was just that you were unlucky enough to not sample the alt allele in the parent. So there was some data from an actual clinical case that came through the Broad um, where from the raw genotype calls that we got when we were done with our variant filtration, there were 417 de novos. And again, like this is genome data and we said the ballpark is about 30 per sample, so that's a lot higher than we expect. So then we recalibrated using posterior. Actually, I think this is exome data, uh, maybe. Either way, it's, it's an awful lot of raw genotype calls to be de novos. But then we applied population priors um, and applied the family information that we had to get down to just 17. And then once we applied our high confidence GQ filter, then there were only eight calls remaining. And if you're a clinical geneticist, eight calls are a lot easier to review than 417. And this is without doing functional annotation or anything like that. So we looked at this mu factor in the prior calculation using the family configuration. Uh, and like I said, it's, it's a parameter. It can be tuned for sensitivity and specificity. Um, from the literature, the value is about 10 to the minus 8. But that leaves us with a relatively low sensitivity. Um, and for the example data that we use, you can increase your sensitivity by decreasing that value of mu. And um, it's just to show you that genotype refinement yields more high quality genotypes. So um, the initial calls are based on flat priors that any genotype is equally likely in those samples. But if you apply population priors, given how likely that allele is in the population, it can improve the confidence of your call, which leads to better data for your downstream analysis. And then beyond that, like I said, one of the tools that a clinical geneticist might use to evaluate those eight de novos would be something like functional annotation, which will give you um, the, the position of each of those variants within the gene, given the transcript set that you're using, like typically something RepSeq. Um, and it'll also tell you whether they're synonymous, in which case that's an a variant that's not particularly interesting in a clinical context or something that's causing a missense or even a loss of function. So we've done through all the pre-processing, discovered variants, filtered them, refined our genotypes, and then finally, Yossi's going to tell us how to evaluate our call sets. <laughs> 